Um, but I'm, I'm excited to be here. I, I heard about this uh, maybe two years ago from Gerard. Said, hey, I'd really love to come and meet this part of the industry at, uh, at some point in time. Uh, Aspen was actually the first place I ever came west of the Mississippi. I grew up in northern Indiana, skiing down the sides of uh, embankments uh, on highways. Uh, and uh, a friend of a friend brought me here when I was 13 to ski that mountain. It was amazing, so it's nice to be back. Uh, I'm going to talk about these two topics, which is really about are you good? So are you good and how do you know? So I imagine the fact that most of you are in this audience, you're probably good at least at one thing, and you might be good at a couple of things. But how do you really know? Like as the world moves around really, really quickly, how do you know how good you are? How do you measure that? And I'm going to talk a lot about those sort of things. It's easy to find me uh, just looking up my name online, my Twitter handle there, uh, my email. So in the spirit of connecting, uh, I'll put this at, up at the end too. But if there are things I say today that uh, work on Twitter, feel free to share those. I also put all these uh, slides up on my slide share, which is also linked off my blog and all that sort of stuff. So if there's anything for you later on or you want to share, go ahead. In terms of who I am and what I'm all about, so I'm an entrepreneur sort of first and foremost. Started my first company when I was 11 and now I'm on my sixth software startup. Um, mechanical engineer from Purdue and also a competitor. So a lot of what I do and kind of makes me up is, is trying to start new things, trying to do those in some process or analytical way, and to do those where I know that I'm good or getting better or trying to win. First thing I'm going to talk about is structure. And so the structure behind there is a structure you guys all know and love. This is what you're all about, the structure of snow. Um, I'm much more aligned to a structure which is its cousin, which is that one. So I'm much more of a water guy. I was a competitive swimmer in college, and I'm going to talk a lot about being a sailor throughout, the, uh, throughout my talk. So in uh, 1990, after a series of different events, I got a chance to try out for a, a high-end professional sailing team. I was like the last guy chosen on that team. Uh, and then we spent the next 18 months building a structure of process and learning uh, and ultimately created enough boat speed to win the 1992 America's Cup. So I was part of that team in America Cubed. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that overall experience and what we learned from that. This is a structure that at the time I didn't really recognize, but is now something that's become very popular in software, software startups, is the concept of build, measure, learn, which are aspects of functional doing things that produce an end result that lead to the next step. Relatively straightforward in concept, but are you asking yourself in your organizations and in your own personal sort of expertise, are you practicing this sort of thing? Coming up with ideas, building something, measuring its own success against itself, against other comparable sort of things, and then whatever you believe to be the best it could possibly be. Collecting data about that, analyzing that data, and learning and repeating. This process, build, measure, learn, I'll repeat lots and lots of times, and it was strange for me because in the America's Cup, I didn't recognize it at the time, or throughout my sailing, I didn't recognize it at the time, but now, being a software entrepreneur, we do it all the time. These are two America's Cup boats uh, uh, from the 2013 Cup. After I did the uh, 92 Cup, uh, um, I did a bunch of uh, other sailing. I did a round the world sailing race. So I did the 93, 94 round the world race, and the, which is the precursor to the Volvo Ocean Race, which is starting tomorrow. I'll talk a little bit about that race a little on, later on. <clears throat> I did the 95 America's Cup, where we lost. And then Larry Ellison, the founder of Oracle, hired me and five other guys to get him into sailboat racing. So we built him a bunch of boats. Um, we built him an uh, 85 foot long boat. We won five world championships for him. And then we said, hey, Larry, if you really want to go big, you've got to go do the America's Cup. So he spent about the next eight years trying to win the America's Cup. And thankfully, in 2007, he brought it back to the United States with Team Oracle. Thank you, Larry, for vindicating my loss. So I feel like that all came sort of full circle. Um, then they, they uh, brought the America's Cup back to the US and scheduled the next one for 2013. And in that process in the America's Cup, 
a lot can be gained, like many of your sort of sports, in the, in the physical aspect of, of uh, the boat. So in a boat like this, you can innovate in all kinds of different areas. You can innovate in boat design, in boat construction, in sail design, in sail construction, in team, teamwork, and all kinds of the systems that go into it. And the more of those different processes you can be evolving and innovating in the build, measure, learn concept, if you add them all up, oftentimes it adds up to boat speed. And if you had to create enough boat speed, we could put all you guys on the boat and you could still win. So it's all about creating boat speed and creating a process to create more boat speed uh, up until that time. So how does that process work? You know, I'll draw it back and forth between the way it works in the America's Cup, the way it works in startups. In the America's Cup, generally you have 18 to 24 months, maybe 36 months before the event when you can put a team together. You raise a bunch of money and you have a hypothesis by where you want to innovate. So I might hire a great engineer for who knows boat construction, someone else who can help us invent carbon fiber, sailcloth, someone else who can help us do something different in the boat. And I give them all money and I say, create a plan. Go hire more engineers, go hire people, and go create a plan for the next 18 months to try and innovate as much as you can in your particular area. You then divide that into smaller parts because building a new America's Cup boat or building a new mass takes a long time. You can't just build, measure, learn, and then flip another one tomorrow. So you have to create a slightly longer structure but also a shorter structure to evolve the evolution in those particular uh, areas. You then divide it into three months. What tests can we actually do to figure out whether or not we're moving in the right direction for a particular thing like a new wing or a new uh, rudder or a new uh, hull design? Break it down further into two-week sprints. And in those particular sprints, which is, a, which is a term that we use a lot in software development, is within that time, all we're trying to focus on is this particular thing we have a certain set of variables that we're trying to test, and every day we go out in those two weeks and we put two boats next to each other and we try and only change a couple of variables. Change too many variables, you can't know what's working. Change too few, you're not making enough progress. This is what my software company looks like, but it's also what it looks like in sailing. And then every day you go out, you get up in the morning, go to the gym, every day you go out, 12 hours on the water, generally, and you try to do these 15 minute long tests. Two boats next to each other, as much concentration as you can, and in that 15 minute test, we try to figure out, did we learn something? At the same time, on those boats, there are somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 sensors. They're, they're measuring everything from stress to acceleration to load, uh, so we're collecting gigantic amounts of data on a day-to-day -day basis, on an hour or second-by-second -second basis from those boats. So you don't have to figure out in your brain, it's all going basically back to the computer, back to the cloud, so all the engineers know in real time what's working and what's not. What variables we're testing and what we're not. What are we learning? Build, measure, learn. And imagine if you can do that 1% better for every hour, you compound that times a big team, times a long time, you can really create huge advantage. So let's talk about Oracle, who had truckloads of money, effectively an unlimited budget, 18 to 36 months worth of advance going up against the other teams that had less money but about the same amount of time. They go through all that testing, their own two-boat testing, and they show up, having made themselves into the America's Cup, on day one of the event itself. Now, the America's Cup is a, what's called a match race. So sometimes there's fleet races where there's lots of boats sailing. Other times it's a match race, just two boats. And unfortunately, at the beginning of the event, oh, you can't see that, it sucks. I'm going to read it. Um, prior to the event, Oracle had been found uh, to be cheating in some of the up-and-coming events. So the judges docked them two races. So they started off at a negative two or two to zero in a best of nine series. That's kind of sucks, right? Anybody been, anybody been in that situation? They come to the starting line first couple of races. After all that testing, they're slow. They're slower than Team New Zealand. And they're slower by enough that all of their maneuvering, they can't get around Team New Zealand. So you're sitting there and you're thinking, shit, we spent probably 10 to $30 million trying to get to a place where we're faster and we're not. This kind of sucks, doubly sucks. So now I'm behind three to zero on the right-hand side is the score. Best of nine. You can see that Team New Zealand continues to kick their ass. But 
each race, Oracle spends a tremendous amount of time videotaping, dissecting, looking and modifying their boat and modifying their team. They're getting a little bit, fit, a little bit better. I can't even see my own notes for that letter. They're collecting data. They're making changes down the left-hand side, getting a little bit better. Lucky break number one happens. All of us have had, when you do come competitive things, every now and again, a lucky break. You create your own luck. The lucky break for them was one day there was too much wind, one day there wasn't enough wind. This got them two more days by which they could continue to make iterations. They'd go out in the day, they'd do their own testing, boat over boat. They got a little bit faster. Now they start to be a little bit balanced. So let's say they went from a deficit to now they're about even in speed. They can win, they can lose. Lucky break number two happens. Notice the score. Two to eight. Team New Zealand only has to win one more race. Has to win one more race, they lose one more race, they lose. They're ahead in this last race, this A3. They're ahead by quite a large margin, but one of the things they changed in the America's Cup this time was a time limit on the race. Used to be unlimited time, whoever got their first one. 40 minute time limit. Team New Zealand's ahead, the wind dies. Race over, race abandoned, nobody wins. Lucky break number two for Oracle. They continue to iterate with two more days of layover. Now they start getting faster. Start getting faster and they start winning. And they start winning to a place where they're, now they've got confidence. Still, they're still behind, but they're almost even. And they go on to win the rest of the races, win the America's Cup. Biggest comeback probably, certainly in sailing, certainly uh, for these kinds of sports, but pro, you know, right up there in terms of comeback for uh, sports as a whole. Build, measure, learn, create your own luck. That's what the boat looks like when it's totally foiling, going 25% you know, faster or 40% faster than the wind itself. It's insane. And you can imagine that at every point along there, there's a huge amount of innovation that's happened and learning that got them to this point, but also learning that got them to win. You gotta always be learning. You gotta create, build, measure, learn cycles. Okay, changing subjects a little bit. Uh, 1997 comes along. I've been spending way too many times drinking beers with people talking about sailboat racing, and I was kind of getting bored. So I quit sailing, and I started, uh, I moved to Seattle, and I started my first software company. That software company failed. I went to Microsoft, I worked at Microsoft for three years learned a lot about what real software looks like, started another software company, modest success, another software company, uh, modest success, next software company, pretty significant success. 2011 comes along, but along the way, what I figured is this whole sort of thing called marketing, I mean, I'm an engineer, I was like, marketing, what do you need that for? I really came to appreciate the value of marketing, and specifically the value of online or digital marketing. But for anybody who's, how many people here would consider themselves in a function, a marketing functional role? Wow, this is great. Um, this is good for me. Uh, it's freaking hard. And you know what's only getting harder? It's hard to know what to do, where should I focus, what should I spend my time on, and is it working? Am I good? How do I know if I'm any good? Am I getting better? Am I getting better relative to what? Relative to myself, relative to my peers? How the hell do I know? So I started thinking really hard about this. So I, when I tend to find problems, what do I do to go and solve them? I just start another software company. So I needed a tool set. So I searched long and hard. I wanted to answer these questions for myself and my own companies around digital and online, online marketing. I couldn't. So I started to build a tool set to harness the data because I'm a data-driven guy. Just like that America's Cup stuff, the more data I can have, the more I can organize that, the more I can build, measure, learn, the more likely I am to find an insight to gain advantage. So we started harnessing the data in a way that said, I want to be able to have a system that allows me, me to measure me, me versus me. Am I making progress week over week, day over day, hour over hour? Am I getting better? Me versus my peers. My peers can be defined in a lot of different ways. It could be companies that are just like me. It could be companies in my same industry. It could be companies that care about the same digital channels as me. But these peers is an important concept because it's all relative. I'm doing really awesome unless I'm falling behind. You don't know that unless you're measuring. And then trying to identify the best in class. Who's the best? Who's the fastest? And how far am I from that? Am I catching up or am I still losing? 
I wanted to build this tool set. I want to build this product. So we started a company called Rival IQ. Commercial, Rival IQ is for digital markers. We, can, we collect all of this at, uh, content for web, search, social, across six social channels, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, G+, YouTube, Instagram. We compare, collect all that for you and your competitors, and we measure it on a daily basis. So you can measure me versus me, me versus my peers, me versus the best in class. Let me give you a little example. These are some screenshots from the product. I'm just gonna pick just YouTube as just one of these channels and just a few companies that I put together. On the Y, on the X axis is time. So this is basically last month up until a couple days ago. On the Y axis is post engagement rate uh, on YouTube. So if you have 10 followers on YouTube and I have 10 million, we're trying to judge relative content. We have to think about rate. So what we do is all the interactions divided per 1,000 followers, it gets you an engagement rate. Get that I'm an engineer yet? Engineer. So here's some time. So the Red Bull crew, been doing really great, posting on a relatively good basis, and getting one particular piece of content uh, to have a relatively high engagement rate. Probably looks pretty good if all you're doing is looking at, at, at Red Bull itself. And here's the content specifically over the last month that's gotten the most engagement. That's the list of the content, a little snapshot of it, how much better it is relative to itself. So this one's three times more engaging than this one. And then relative to the average, relative to the collection of peers. So if you're a YouTube brand manager or a Red Bull person, you can start to say, what of my stuff works? How's it doing relative to itself? And how's it doing relative to my peers? And then exactly how much is actually engaging. Anybody know Michelle Fan? There's one. Michelle Fan is a YouTube personality, seven million followers. She creates videos about makeup. Mostly targeted at women, I think. Mostly targeted at young women or girls. Michelle Fan created content that is, what, two times more engaging than that best, most engaging Red Bull piece of content? Pretty interesting. Might want to know what that video is, what content's in that, especially if you care about marketing to women or young girls. Well, there's the answer to that. Now, to me, this is totally clear why this video is so important and why it got so much engagement. It's because it's about grunge, and everybody cares about grunge because they're from Seattle. So that particular piece of video, which is fun to go and watch, is how do you sort of use makeup to make yourself look grunge. But let's talk about somebody else, one of our friends here, GoPro. So GoPro, compared to that, is actually even more engaging than Michelle Fan and Red Bull. And this particular piece of content, which if you haven't watched it yet, is amazing. Right? This is a piece of content that just came out, well, a few, I don't know, this, within this month. And incredible content, which is twice as engaging, effectively, as their best content from before during the month. And so within this platform, if you're a digital marketer, if you're YouTube or your GoPro or your Michelle fan, it gives you the opportunity to measure yourself versus yourself, yourself versus your peers, and yourself versus best in class over time across a lot of different axes in a way where all the data is being collected. You don't have to do anything, just like on that America's Cup stuff. <coughs> all right, changing subjects yet again. Um, I mentioned that I was a competitor. Uh, I mentioned that uh, I was a swimmer and then a sailor and now a bunch of other sort of stuff, but now I'm over the hill, so I'm just a recreational kind of guy. Um, but I'm really intrigued with what happens when we put these same basic concepts into the field of athletics. What happens for athletes for sure and for humans in a more broad level is what if you had all the data? What if the data just flowed out of us into some place and allowed me to compare myself to myself, myself to my peers, and myself to best in class? What if? And I think that what if is gonna be answered or continuing to be answered over the next three to five years in some really cool ways. So once you sell a company, as I did in 2011, you get the opportunity to start making angel investments. So I've started to make angel investments in marketing companies and companies that fit into this particular space. And if you do this well, we can all achieve what I would call optimal health peak performance. Everybody lives at a different level of peak performance, but when you have all the data and you have all the comparison, you can start to make choices on what is my own optimal health? What is my own peak performance? What choices can I make to be better? 
This is a company I'm an investor in. It's called Sensoria, based in Seattle. They make a flexible fabric sensor network. The first ones are sewn into socks. So that sock, which I can show you later on if you want, totally flexible, feels like a normal running sock, can pick up at very, very high frequencies pressure in your feet. So you could wear those socks and Usain Bolt could wear those socks and you could start to figure out exactly how does his feet work when he runs versus yours. Or yours versus yesterday. Or yours when you felt really good versus not felt so good. Sensori is building that into fabrics which will go into socks and shirts and all kinds of different flexible fabrics which will go into collecting data in real time, primarily in this case around pressure. But pressure happens when you're flexing your muscles. It happens in a lot of different ways. So that's one data point. Another important point is basically taking the sensor data through our phones, which provide basically an uplink to the cloud, and they provide us a display mechanism or an alerting mechanism. So a lot of these things you'll see is basically connect the sensor to the phone, the phone goes to the cloud, the cloud does the analysis and pushes it back to the end user. Anybody seen this one yet? This is a digital contact lens that can detect glucose. Google's working on this with Novartis. There's a professor at University of Washington working on this too. So being able to put transistors into there, they'll be able to measure in real time your glucose levels. Pretty cool if you're diabetic. Probably useful if you're trying to think about yourself from a hydration perspective or other kinds of things. Measuring to your phone, up to the cloud, and, and back down. Anybody seen that one before? Smart skin. The ability basically with no additional battery power, just using the power that comes from your own body to measure your heart rate, to measure your stress level, to measure all kinds of things. Imagine if you start putting that over your whole body or certainly in certain strategic places on your body. It's the next generation of the sensoria kinds of ideas of being able to in real time or all the time measuring that kind of data. Anyone seen this one? Also a Seattle based company called Icos. This is developed by an uh, Olympic swimming coach. And what this particular product does is it allows, he videotapes a swimmer or anybody who does a physical activity, actually. It works for all kinds of physical activities. You can videotape the best in the world and me. And then they break the video down into this really interesting way. They have this audio track that goes with it. And this is a video goggles. You wear it on your eyes. And it literally pumps into your brain the ways your body is supposed to act to do the action correctly. Because if you imagine skiing or you imagine swinging a golf club or you imagine swimming, 80% of your brain activity is the same as if you're actually doing it. So they've proven this with Olympic swimmers. They've proven this for kids who, who after an injury couldn't figure out how to walk again. It's incredible. So this is like pumping data out of the cloud straight into your brain. I get excited about that stuff. Um, I've been really fortunate um, in my career to find myself in these different sorts of venues, whether it be sailing or technology, and I find myself fortunate to be in this venue with a set of people I don't know very well, probably going to expose me to a whole bunch of ideas I never thought about before. And I think we all need to be really successful. We need a set of coaches, mentors, and a community. Anybody know this guy, Brad Feld? Brad Feld's one of the best venture capitalists in the US and maybe the world right now. He lives in Boulder. Um, has invested in companies like Fitbit or Zynga uh, or Sphero, if you've seen those. Brad's also a big runner. Brad and I spent a lot of time running together. In fact, the first time we met was in Denver at a conference running in the morning. Um, he invested in my last company, the one that was successful. And he's been a great mentor to me. I've learned a tremendous amount from him in terms of the structure by which to build companies the data by which you can sort of aggregate and utilize, and the networks that you need to be connected into. CEO networks, thought leadership networks, other sort of engineering networks. And hopefully, you know, we're, I'm part of that network now for you and vice versa. So look for your own coaches, your own mentors, your own connections, and create that level of community. Because nobody's really as, every, as good as everybody. And if we're good, we have to create this sort of environment which is competitive collaborative, and really comparative. So I, had, I struggled to try and, I did at the beginning, struggled to find the connection between snow and water. But I found this, I dug this out. So 1993, 94, I did the round the world waste, the same one that is coming up, or similar one that's coming up now with the Volvo. Um, this is 63 degrees south in the Southern Ocean. 
It's the longest leg of the race, which goes from Uruguay to New Zealand, uh, sorry, to Australia. Uh, 20, in that case, is 7,000 miles long, 27 days nonstop through the Southern Ocean. Big, huge waves. There's nothing to stop it down there. Really windy. Amazing sailing. Well, one day, day before Thanksgiving, 1993, we've been sailing all night long, pitch black, super windy, and the sun comes up, and this is what we see. Come on, Siri. <laughs> High school friend of mine invented Siri, by the way. Um, so this is what we see. In fact, that's not the one. We could actually quote 27 of them. Not quite as big. That was the biggest one. But were they there all night long? And we just missed them? Did they just come up? I don't know. But being in that sort of situation, it was one of those things where I could really tie water back to snow. <laughs> I was looking for one of those. So the question for all of you is, are you good enough to win? whatever that means to you. So I'm going to tell you one last story, sailing story, since I don't know that many snow stories. Um, uh, after that picture in the Southern Ocean was taken, we finished that leg five, and we finished into Uruguay. That particular time that I did the race, it was five legs long. It was a cumulative time race. Um, and so we had won the first, ra the first leg of that race by quite a lot. We got second by a little. Then we won the next leg by a significant amount, got second by a little. And we come into Uruguay with effectively the race kind of wrapped up. All we had to do is kind of go, go up to Florida and then back over to England. Pretty straightforward, not that windy, not that dangerous. Everybody's feeling pretty good. So we're going up the coast of Brazil, leading, our, leading the race at the time. And what happens? Who said it? Anybody? Guess? That's it. Mass falls down. So in that instant, race is over for us in terms of winning. Cumulative time race, no way. You can't sail. It doesn't sail very well when the mass is in the water, not in the air. So that race was over. We're off the coast of Brazil. So in, in our minds, we effectively said, dude, how do I get to shore to get off of this freaking boat to be done with this nightmare that we have? It took us about three days to go from that time when the mass fell down, when we immediately had to protect the boat so it didn't puncture it and sink us to get to shore, to fix the mast, to limp into the last leg of the race, or last to finish into Florida. We were last by five or six days. So now we're well down in the middle of the pack. Um, but what was interesting is the whole emotion of the team had changed through that to going from it's all about winning to it's all about doing the best that we can, doing the best we can for our sponsors, doing the best for ourselves to complete this whole mission around the world. So sort of you know, pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps, got excited again. Um, and then this is us literally on the last two hours of the race finishing into uh, Southampton, uh, a good 12 hours ahead of the next guy, uh, kicking their ass yet again uh, on the last one. And so with that, I, I will leave you with one sort of anecdote that a great mentor and executive coach told me. He said, if you're really trying to build a great company or a great community, you can only need really four words. Hello, you know, please, thanks, hello, and goodbye. And if you greet everybody with please and thanks and hello and goodbye, you're going to create a really great culture, assuming you can add in some build, measure, learn. So with that, I thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for paying attention. And goodbye. <laughs> take, take questions. And that was one and a half minutes early for you. Unless, of course, you want more sailing stories, which, you know. Questions? Yeah? That whole thing of measuring how good you are, is that, can you do that on a personal basis as well as, I mean, because a lot of the stuff you're showing is on a company basis? Absolutely. I mean, who uses Strava in here? I mean, Strava, from a mountain biking perspective, is that, right? It, I mean, you can say, well, how fast am I relative to Lance on whatever sunny, sunny side, sunshine trail? Sunny, sunny side? Which I'm going to try tomorrow, and I won't be probably there. Probably there. Um, so Strava is a great example of that, or Map My Run, another sort of example of that, of this ability to say, well, at that case, you're, you're measuring sort of an n number of data points, a relatively small amount. All of us who are in that space are, are still struggling with how do you correlate lots of different disparate data? How do I get my glucose along with my sleep, along with my food, along with my you know, particular performance, and how do I measure that over time, and how do I find causation and correlation? And yet that's the same 
problem that we're sort of solving a little bit with Rival IQ. I mean, YouTube and Facebook are not the same thing. They're kind of the same thing, but when you measure engagement, they're sort of different. So a lot of us are working in software in these areas of, of performance management, of which Rival IQ is one form on business, social marketing, or digital marketing, and Strava would be a good example, I think, of a company innovating quite well um, in the category of human management or performance management from a sporting perspective. Um, and slowly but surely stitching together these APIs or the data from a variety of different places. Another company I'm an investor in is a company called EveryMove. They um, aggregate data from all different kinds of data sources, primarily to give you rewards for healthy living. So if your company wants to say, hey, you walked a little bit and you ate well and you slept well and you did this, you can collect all that stuff from Fitbits and lots of other places. You put it all through the EveryMove platform and your, your company can say, hey, awesome job. You know, let's give you a coupon or a health club membership or $10 off on your insurance. That's what every move is trying to do. But I think the whole process is it's about data and sensors into a semi-normalized process and then the philosophical approach of me versus me, me versus my peers and best in class. And if you want to go right into Independence Pass, at least for all the people who know Strava, we know how fast you have to go. I think it's around 30 minutes-ish, right? Crazy. So you think like, wow, I kicked ass. I went up there in an hour, 14 minutes. <laughs> Except for the guy, and that's maybe not even the best guy, but he's pretty good. I mean, a friend of mine just finished Race Across America, uh, Ride Across America. This guy's insane, right? He's won the Canadian Ultraman twice by himself. He's like the most fit guy that I know. And so he's riding. He did that race 10 and a half days, as fast as you can get across or 10 days. He's riding, you know, 500 miles a day-ish. The guy who won? 25% faster than him. It's insane. Like, really? I'm like, no way. No one's going to be faster than John. And he watched this guy. I mean, he's like 700 miles a day. Just, it's, it's insane. So in some ways, there's lots of forms of that sort of measurement which is happening. And I think the sensor stuff is super exciting because it's happening in lots of different categories and slowly but surely we'll normalize the data to provide that human performance. And then where, will, it, will it work first for high-end athletes who can, like a Usain Bolt who can afford it? Will it work for some of your athletes where you're trying to measure it either from a performance perspective or from a marketing perspective? I mean, imagine that mountain biking video with all kinds of acceleration overlaid over it, over heart rate overlaid over it. All that's going to come very soon if it's not showing up already. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. You had a question you mentioned about um, being a business. You, you talk about collaboration between other executives. And then you talk about thought leadership or thought exchange. Uh -huh. How do you get yourself into that process while still pulling yourself away from the day-to-day -day metrics that you have to do? Yeah. So I think the first you have to conceptually believe that that, that has either when you think about, let's say, connecting with other thoughtful people, which that's why I'm here, right? You have to think first, am I doing that because I enjoy it? Which I do. I enjoy it just personally. This makes me happy to be in a place where I'm learning a lot about things that I might not know that much about. That's personal, selfish benefit. Then is there direct benefit or indirect to my company? So there's probably a little indirect benefit of me telling you about Rival IQ and maybe some of you guys want to use it. Now that's indirect. I'm not here to market it per se. Um, and then is there benefit by me learning about things in a different sort of context? So you, then you just have to, do, I mean, for me at least, it's a structure of how much time am I going to put into that particular thing, waiting, what's super fun for me, to what thing is going to be really good for things that I'm invested in or advise, advise in, where I have sort of a fiduciary responsibility to, to deliver. Um, and then things where I just think I can learn a lot. And so I came this, this week for New York. I'm involved with a program called Techstars. Anybody heard about Techstars? an accelerator program, primarily for software companies. Brad Feld was one of the founders of that. Um, they're based in Boulder, Seattle, New York, Boston, a bunch in the geograph other geographies now. Three-month-long three program for tech entrepreneurs, usually three, four times people. So I spend a huge amount of time mentoring teams like that. It's probably a 70-30 transfer, hopefully uh, probably delivering 70-30%, but I get a lot back from that. And so it makes me smarter because I hear questions from a small team. They say, like, how are we going to do this? And I go, shit, I don't know. It's a good question. Let me go find an answer for either through my networks or through my own sort of research if I believe that there's an opportunity there. So that's one. And then we've done, I think, a good job in technology is, is especially when you start to have investor networks, is creating CEO groups and mailing lists. I mean, 
Just this morning, everybody seen Ello or heard of Ello, the new super hot social network? So those guys are, I share an investor with them. So like for the last two days, there's been like 500 emails from the CEO of Ello, like, oh my God, things blowing up and I don't know how to do search and everyone's bitching about this and I can't do customer service. And so we're all helping him, some of us with you know, expertise in one category or some expertise in another category and that'll come back around. So I have a structured way of thinking about my time, which I'll do extracurricular activities. I would put this one into pure extracurricular for me. Sometimes I do these events where it's marketing for Rival IQ or something else. Um, and then sometimes I look across a year's calendar and I say, am I doing enough things where I'm putting myself in a place where I think I can learn something that's very different than what I know now? Does that answer your question? Yep. Other questions? God, I got you like how many? 25 minutes ahead of schedule. Yeah. Amazing. So Amazing. Thank, you, thank you very much. <laughs>